were many key decisions he would have made in order to protect Egypt and save his pharaoh's skin. A man who steers his people and his king through great adversity might expect a big reward. So, did Joseph get one? As a reward for his achievements, Joseph asks Pharaoh if his family can settle in Egypt. The Bible says Joseph and his brothers settled in a city called Pyramuses. But archaeologists surveying the area could find no trace of the city. Then, in the 1970s, a farmer found the first remarkable clue the remains of a colossal statue. Archaeologist Irina Forster Muller thinks the statue proves that this was the site of the city mentioned in the Bible. the great Ramses the second was one of the most important kings of the new kingdom this is the area of Pyramese his capital there was a huge city in this time we have here the statue and we know we have a temple over there and several other temples and uh, villas The find raised hopes that this was where Joseph had settled and was reunited with his brothers. And Yusuf, and a good Yusuf. But these hopes were dashed when archaeologists established that Pyramuses was built 300 years after Joseph's time. In addition, there was no sign of a Semitic presence at all. But inscriptions were then discovered suggesting that P. Ramesses was built on top of an older city called Avaris. If they could find it, then maybe they could find Joseph. Then they found it. Excavations are gradually revealing the secrets of Avaris. It was built 300 years before Pyramuses, just when Joseph was thought to have lived. And its ruins revealed tantalizing clues. Although most of the buildings were Egyptian in style, one area was distinctly Canaanite. But the most compelling evidence of a Semitic presence came from inside the houses. These bodies were found buried in sideways postures, a typically Canaanite tradition. And objects found inside the burial pits left archaeologists in no doubt. We have a lot of uh, Canaanite uh, shapes like jugs here, combined with Egyptian shapes like the small vessel here. We find sometimes weapons attached to the tombs, like this sword. It's made of bronze, and then with the same tomb comes a belt in very fragile condition, which the male burial had around his hip. So we have always the mixture of both cultures. These finds are consistent with the Bible's claim that Semites settled in the Nile Delta, but only poor Semites, perhaps slaves. None of it indicated someone of Joseph's status, a high-ranking pharaonic official of Semitic origin, lived there. But further finds at Avaris suggest that archaeologists are closing in on that elusive evidence. The excavations have since returned to agricultural use, but there are extensive plans and photos. David Roll, a specialist in biblical and ancient history, examined, then reconstructed part of the site. To the north of where they have their dig house, they started digging in a flat field of wheat. They didn't expect to find very much, but just under the surface, they found these remarkable finds. A beautiful villa, which is the quality of a palace. In fact, it probably is a palace, but it's not of a king. It's not a palace of a king. 
reconstructed, you can see how complex it is. There are various elements to it built at different times. It had 12 columns along its colonnade, and that's a significant number in the Bible. This small palace looked like the home of a high-ranking official. But it was a find at the back of the palace that most intrigued archaeologists. A tomb topped with a pyramid. The tomb was over there, uh, to the south of the palace. And one of the most interesting tombs was that, that of a dignitary well, with, with a, a tomb chapel. And inside this tomb chapel, we found the rest of a tomb statue. The statue had been vandalized, but when reassembled, it shocked the experts. This could not have been the statue of an Egyptian official. When we get it back to the museum and restore it, it looks like this. And you can see that the head's been completely smashed, the lower part of the head, and the eyes have been gouged out. But the most important thing is this. It's an amazing haircut. We don't see anything like that in Egypt before this time. And the hair colour is bright red. This guy had flame red hair. The details were typical of Semitic people. Another little detail is the skin colour. Here we can see the forehead. And this here is yellow skin. And that's typical of what the Egyptians did to represent foreigners from the north, people with pale skin. It wasn't just on the hair and face that paint was found. Flakes of red and black paint were found on the outline of a garment and with it, a distinctive pattern. Could this be a multicolored coat? Could this be Joseph? The absence of a nameplate means there's no way of knowing, but for David Rohn, there are no other contenders. We have no other example of something quite as extraordinary as this. We have no pyramid tomb for an official estate. We have no other palace for a private individual. These sort of things are things reserved for royalty, usually. So this is extraordinary. We have no other examples to compare it to. But if you're trying to imagine the rewards of somebody who gave such service to Egypt, who saved it from the famine, you would expect these type of things to be given. Most Egyptian tombs were stripped of treasures such as furniture, clothes, and jewelry. This tomb was no exception, but in this case, the bones were also taken away. If a plunderer had gone in there to, to wreck the tomb, he would have left the bones behind. He wouldn't have taken the bones away. Bones don't have any intrinsic value. So somebody's removed the body from this tomb. Now, the story of Joseph is, at the time of Exodus, when Moses takes the Israelites out of Egypt, he takes the coffin of Joseph with him, so he would have left an empty tomb. So here we have a guy with a multicolored coat with an empty tomb. It's got to be Joseph. And the Joseph story is important for that reason, providing the link to the Exodus.